Now let's look at what it actually means to be the inverse functions, okay? So let's talk about inverse functions. Now, for right now, I'm going to use letters F and G as my functions. But later on, I'll introduce some new notation, okay? <clears throat> if F and G are both one to one, and when you compose F and G it gives you the identity function for all x. And when you compose f and g the other way, it also gives you the identity function for all x. Then we say, F and G are inverse functions of each other, or just simply inverses of each other. And the notation that we use often is that G is equal to F inverse. And what we do is we write kind of an exponent of negative one. That doesn't mean we're taking the expression to the negative one power. That just means that's just a shorthand for the inverse function of F. Okay. Now be careful. This one-to-one -one thing is very important. Oftentimes, people will see um, this. They'll say, well, let's look at f of x equals x to the fifth and g of x equals x to the one-fifth power, okay? And let's see if these are inverses of each other. Well, they're both one-to-one. -one. They pass the horizontal line test if you check them. Now let's look at the function composition. If I did f of g of x, f of g of x means take f and input x to the one fifth power. x to the one-fifth power raised to the fifth power becomes x to the first. That side works. You can see what's going to happen with the other side as well. 
if you did f of me, g of f of x, into the g, we put the expression x to the fifth. We replace the input of g with x to the fifth. Sure enough, we get back x. So f and g are inverses. All right. So those are inverses, and you can check it that way. However, and this is where it gets kind of weird. Let's do another example and see if these are inverses. Let's take x squared and the positive square root of x. A lot of people, when they get doing this too quickly, they will go f of g of x, and they'll just start saying, uh, let's just do it all the way. And they'll do this. They'll say square root of x squared equals x. And then they'll do it the other way. And they'll say, well, we're done. It sh they should be, quote, inverses. The trouble with this is that this f of x, as we saw earlier, is not one to one. And in particular, that causes some troubles here. Like when I plug in a negative number. If I plug in a negative number, I can't actually plug in a negative number inside the square root and expect to get a real number. If I plugged in, you know, negative something, and then squared it, it gets, it gets ugly. I have to use complex numbers and it's mess, messy. So since this x squared is not one to one, this this stuff is gonna not matter. And it's going to throw things off like when you plug in a negative, you'll have some options to do. Hopefully that made sense. But weird things happen when you plug in a negative here. You don't simply get square root of negative and then be able to square it. Uh, then that turns you into the complex numbers and squaring. It's a mess. So since it's not one to one, F and G are not inverses. Okay. So be careful about that one-to-one -one thing. <clears throat> now the question, obviously, if I give you two equations, you can check if they're inverses by checking both of them being one-to-one, -one, and then checking if their composition leads to just the value of x. Again, this is just the identity function. If their composition is the identity function, then we can do that. But a lot of times,
what we're going to do is we're going to look for inverses. We want to find f of negative 1 given a function. So if I give you a function, can I find its inverse? So how are we going to do that? Let me explain what's happening with inverses graphically. And I'll also kind of explain why we need it to be one-to-one -one here as we do this too. So let's go to Desmos. All right. Now, before I start explaining things graphically, I just want you to understand why. Well, let's let's do the x to the fifth. Is that one of them? F equals x to the fifth. And then g of x equals x to the one fifth. This was our example. <clears throat> I want you to look at the symmetry in these two graphs. Notice that this purple one, if I switched it around the line y equals x, every point on here would have a corresponding value over here. So x to the fifth and x to the one fifth are symmetric about the y equals x. Now, what that means is if you would have swapped the value, the output value in one, with the input value, you would have ended up with the same thing. Let me say that again. If you swapped the y for the x in one of these, you would have ended up with the other equation. If you would have swapped the y value for the x value, so let me explain what I mean. The output is the y, y equals x to the fifth. What if I would have graphed x equals y to the fifth? Notice that's the exact same thing. So y equals x to the one fifth. So what happens in my one-to-one -one functions is that I can swap an X with a Y and that will give me the inverse function when I simplify. And that's why we really needed that one-to-one -one aspect. Notice what's wrong with the x squared versus square root of x. The square root of x only gives us one part of the graph that I need for the symmetry. The other part needs to be down here, okay? I need both the top and bottom of this sort of parabola on its side to get an inverse. And if I had a horizontal line test fail up here, the vertical line test would fail down here. 
That makes sense. So in order for me to have an actual inverse function, I need it to satisfy the vertical line test. And if it fails the horizontal line test, then its inverse is going to fail the vertical line test. So that's why we needed one to one. Hopefully that all makes sense. So y equals x squared is not going to have an inverse function because an inverse function would fail the vertical line test and therefore not be a function. Now that's a really, really long explanation. In practicality, if we want to find the inverse and we're given f, what we're going to do is make sure f is one to one. And then we're going to swap y's and x's and then solve for y. And that'll give us the inverse function. So make sure f is 1 to 1, swap x's and y's, solve for y. And one to one guarantees that we can solve for y here. That's what I was trying to get at. Graphically, it means that you can actually get a function that does not fail the vertical line test. Algebraically, it means you can solve for y uniquely. All right? So like here, if I gave you f of x equals x squared, We have y equals x squared, so then we swap x equals y squared, and then we try to solve for y. So I think swap. Trouble is, if you were to solve for y, we've solved enough quadratics that we know that we're to solve for y needing both the positive and the negative square root of x. That's basically two functions or two equations there, right? Can't do a positive and a negative. So we can't solve for y uniquely in this case. So that's the algebraic reason f of x equals x squared does not have an inverse. All right? Can't solve. Solve uniquely. So f of x equals x squared has no inverse. Function. Based out over the real numbers. All right? So the one-to-one -one guarantees you can solve for y uniquely. All right? Let me do this. Let's find f inverse when my function is 3x minus 4. f of x equals 3x minus 4. Now, that means Essentially, on a graph, y is equal to 3x minus 4. Now I'm going to do a swap. I like writing the word swap in there, so I know I've done it. And all I'm doing is everywhere I see a y, I'm placing an x. 
Every C, everywhere I see an X, I'm placing a Y. And then I'm going to solve for Y. I'm going to add four to both sides. We have to do that. I'll add four. Then I'm going to divide both sides by three. I get one third X plus four thirds equals Y, or again, Y equals one third X plus four thirds. And what that means is my inverse function is one third X plus four thirds. And if you wanted to check, you could check. Plug in one third X plus four thirds. I'm just composing the F with the F inverse. So plug that, plug in F inverse into my F. Sure enough, you get X, which is the identity function. Or you could plug in your original F expression into your F inverse. Sure enough, I get the identity function. Okay. Now, this is just a check. I wouldn't expect you to do this every single time. It's good to do, but you don't have to do it every single time. Okay. The big idea is that in order to find the inverse, we swap the role of x with the role of y, and then we solve for y, and that y becomes our f inverse. We can do that with any one-to-one -one function. Any one-to-one -one function, we can do that um, uniquely. All right? So let's take a couple of examples. Let's take g of x equals cube root oops, of x plus 2 minus 4. So the cube root of x plus 2 minus 4. What I'm going to do is I'm going to see this as y equals the cube root Oh, I'm sorry. I should have said find G inverse. So we're finding G inverse. So I convert the G to the Y, and then I do a swap. I swap every X I see with the letter Y, and every Y I see with the letter X. And then I solve for y. In this case, I'd add four to both sides. Let's go ahead and do that. We did the same thing. We add four to both sides. Good. So it ends up with x plus four equals the cube root of y plus two. We should know we can undo a cube root by taking both sides to the third power. 
since this is a one one function, that's a unique thing. And then I would subtract two from both sides. Now I'm going to put the y on the left. We end up with y equals x plus four cubed and then minus two. And what that means is that my inverse function, g inverse, is x plus four cubed minus two. That's my final answer. Let me do a couple of others. All right. Let's find, I'll do F inverse again. If f of x is equal to 8 over x minus 2, turns out this does pass the horizontal line test. All the horizontal lines only go through one. So obviously I see that as y equals eight over x minus two. Then I'm gonna swap the roles of x and y. Everywhere I see a y, I put an x. Every, see it, every time I see an x, I put a y. Now this is a little bit tricky, but I'm going to multiply both sides by y minus 2. And then I'm also going to divide both sides by x. Actually, let me, let me rephrase that. Think of this as x over 1 equals 8 over y minus 2. Now we're dealing with proportions and you're cross multiplying. So you're multiplying both sides by y minus 2. Getting 8. Now I'm going to divide both sides by x. I get y minus 2 is equal to 8 divided by x. And now I'm going to add 2 to both sides. Now be careful when you do that. When you do that, this 8 over x still is treated as a fraction. And then the plus two goes on at the end. But there you go. Now I know, since I swapped and solved for y, now I know that my inverse function is eight over x plus two. Now, just so that we're aware, while f of x is a one-to-one -one function, you can't plug two into it, all right? So two is not the domain of f of x. Same thing here. While this is a one-to-one -one function, zero is not the domain of f inverse. 
So be careful about uh, that. Don't think that all real numbers has to be your domain. These are inverse functions of each other. But we do have to be conscious. You can't plug in every single thing you want to. You can't plug in a two into there or else you're dividing by zero. Can't plug in a zero into there or else you're dividing by zero. Let's do one other. And it'll be similar to this one. Let's find G inverse when G of X is equal to 3x plus 1 over x minus 5. See if I can do that. This one's going to take a little bit more algebra. That's all I was trying to get at here. So obviously, this is like y equals 3x plus 1 over x minus 5. And then we're going to swap. Swap the x's with the y's. Goodness gracious. All right, swap the x's with the y's. Now we do the cross multiply or multiply both sides by y minus 5. However, you want to think about that. y minus 5 times x is equal to 3y plus 1. Now, in this case, if I divide both sides by x, then I have y's on both sides, right? So I don't want that. I want y's to be all on the same side. So what I need to do in this case is I need to multiply out the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Now, if I want all the y's by themselves, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add 5x to both sides, and I'm going to subtract 3y from both sides. Okay, That might be hard to see with my green. Run out of batteries. But the goal is to get all of the terms with the y's in them on the left-hand side and all of the terms with out y's on the right-hand side. What this gives me on the left-hand side is y times x, or x times y, minus 3y. And on the right-hand side, I get 5x plus 1. Here's how I solve. I factor out a y. Then I divide both sides by the quantity x minus 3. That is how I isolate my y. My y then becomes 5x plus 1 divided by x minus 3. And so now I know that g inverse is 5x plus 1 divided by x minus 3. If I want to check that, I could do function composition. Another way I could maybe informally check that 
is to go to my Desmos. So we got three X plus one, three X plus one, sorry. Over X minus five. I zoom out, that's what that looks like. Notice that all my horizontal lines only go through once. And then the G inverse, I don't know if I can, of X is supposed to be 5X plus one. divided by x minus three. Uh, let's do a different letter for the g. There you go. And if I go y equals x, every point that's on the green, like about 420, should have a corresponding point on the red, about 24. See that? Every point on the green, like 3.765 and about almost 26, should have a corresponding point on the red, almost 26. There you go. Does that make sense? So each point on the red has a corresponding point on the green as it gets flipped over this y equals x. So that's another nice way to see that we did in fact find the correct inverse function. You can graph those two. and see that they have that nice symmetry about the line y equals x. Okay. Right. Now there's lots and lots and lots of techniques for solving for y. So I'm not gonna go through every single technique. This is a common one where you have to get all the y terms on one side and then factor out the y. Um, another common one, is if you want to get rid of a one third power, you take both sides to the third power. If you want to get rid of a take both sides to the fifth power, then you take so both sides to the one fifth power. All right. So there's a lot of different techniques. A few of them we've seen. A few of them I'm sure we haven't seen um, or on this video, but. Uh, a lot that we've seen so far in this class. So I'm not gonna go through every single technique of solving for Y. It's just algebraic manipulation. But the basic idea is that you swap X's and Y's and then you try to solve for Y. Once you've done that, if you can do so uniquely, then you found the inverse function. Right. So that's it. That's how we find inverse function.